Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the State of the Web. My guest is Adam Argyle. He's a developer advocate at Google and creator of the VizBug design tool. And today we're talking about the state of design systems. Let's get started. Hey, Adam, thanks for being here. So I want to ask you, what purpose does design fulfill on a web page? What are its goals? Mm, uh, that's a good question. At a high level, I feel like uh, design does a couple things. We have, uh, you know, it's supposed to be guidance. Um, you want to have credibility so that it's like the better designed it is, the more credible it feels, right? You don't want to spend money somewhere where it looks like there's no design, even though that might not accurately reflect the product or what you're, you're investing in. But um, I like thinking about uh, at a very, very high level what design is doing is we have uh, affirmative design and we have critical design. And critical design is the type of design that uh, is exploratory, it sort of provokes you. Uh, brutalism is a good example of critical design where you're looking at something and you're like, wow, this is like stark and shocking, uh, even though it's sort of retro in a way. So there's design can do uh, really interesting things to your psyche in terms of like challenging you. and uh, Or we can see more of this affirmative design, which is kind of getting more popular. It's safer where you're sort of piling onto the social norms of like what's going on in design because it's safe and it's familiar and so folks will visit your site and they might feel lulled into uh, an action because they visit it and it's beautiful and airy and they might be looking at something terribly uh, not attractive like uh, let's say a scrubber for you know your sink. Uh, you can make a scrubber in a sink look very nice. Uh, so you visit this site and it says, do you have problems with your sink feeling dirty and nasty? Well, we've got the scrubber for you. So it's like every design states the problem and then brings in the solution. Um, and that's sort of lulling you into this behavior. They're like, ah, oh, isn't this familiar? You're here. It looks like a normal ad. It has the normal flow. Let me guide you down this path and we'll take you through this excellent experience. Um, so design does both those things. That's really high level too. It does a whole bunch of other stuff too. Um, but yeah, I think that's sort of what it's trying to do is credibility, flow. Uh, you know, somebody else has done the work to organize it for me. So it's supposed to be easy. I'm supposed to be here to consume quickly and, and get a task done. Guiding the user towards the solution for that web page. Yeah, and in that case, it's usually the solution that the web page wants you to go down, uh, which is where, you know, design has a little bit of cunning in there. Um, some people say design is a type of trickery as well. Um, which, right, we have like dark patterns that are like legit trickery, uh, or we have uh, light patterns, which are, it's trickery where we're just sort of like, no, this is just a healthy guidance. You can, you can diverge, it's okay, um, but yeah. So in terms of the tools that designers have, what is a design system and what are its goals? Ooh, so design system, that's sort of, that's a hard one to nail down. It's gone through all these phases. I, my current opinion on what a design system is, is where we previously had design deliverables that were sort of like a design system, and then we had engineering deliverables that were kind of like a design system. What we have with a design system, it's a, uh, a merging of the two, where designers have their symbols and their files that generally represent the same components that engineers are making, and there's like this oh, 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 coming together moment in a design system. Um, that's what I think we're currently personifying that as, where before engineering had like a pattern library or component set, uh, and then the designers had a style guide. So what are some of the principles of a good design system? Ah, yes. Okay, so at a high level, I think a design system intends to make future uh, us have easier decisions. Like in the future, I shouldn't have to invent a new button. I shouldn't have to invent a new login form. Like these things should be solved already. So at a high level, that's one of its most you know, valuable propositions is that future you, or even if you're being really considerate, like other customers of your design system, um, customers being uh, maybe other development teams, uh, other designers, maybe even like the marketing team, you have people that want to use that. Those are, I, I call them your customers. So a, a good design system is considerate of them and it empowers them. But at like a low level, um, when you're implementing a design system, you should have things like reusability, extendability. You should have accessibility built in. Essentially, these Lego pieces should have solved a bunch of problems for other people already and, and be battle tested and have gone through, you know, okay, I'm gesturing right now, but the gesture is uh, imagine a rock that I'm tumbling into a pearl. Like we'll take and then we'll have a bunch of pearls to give. 
um, so that other people can and get their tasks done easier. And also, there's some something about that where you need interactivity as part of your design system, right? Well, I have seen some design systems that um, don't just talk about the component. They uh, give you levers to pull, so you can visit a page. And there's some uh, tools out there that do this, like uh, Storybook is one. Uh, we have other tools coming out, like FramerX. So there's like design tools that are coming out very f either very focused on this one particular use case, um, or you have ones that are a little bit more documentation focused. So they're less like compose and build, and more like you know tinker and play and assess what component you need beforehand. And I like that tangible learning. It, it's really nice, especially for someone visual like a designer, to come into a design system website and peruse and find a component and be curious and play, uh, it helps get really sticky, the, the features and the capabilities of that. In terms of the life cycle of a design system, is it ever really done or is it more iterative? <laughs> done. <laughs> uh, no, I think they, they, they really only grow. Uh, I have seen them be reborn or we've, you know, we've seen them be reborn uh, with brands or they're reborn as com complete redesigns. But no, I don't think they're done. I think they're growing. I think we're making teams now to facilitate these things because they are so difficult. Um, and they only grow in complexity because, well, there's considerations that are often lost, like mobile. Uh, you know, a lot of design systems are like, look at our sweet desktop design system. And they're like, cool, what's it do on mobile? We're like, we'll get there. <laughs> Same with like accessibility uh, and layouts. And anyway, there's like a few other things that I think uh, some design systems can do to, to grow and be even better. And I think that's just what we're discovering right now. Like folks are playing uh, and they're trying to figure out what aspects of the design system are really meaningful and what's crufty. And you know, we're young industry. We're all still learning kind of like what this means. Do you have any examples of older design systems that we draw inspiration from today? Ooh, yes. Okay. Ooh. Okay. So old design systems, I have a bunch of them that I'm a big fan of. We could go back in terms of like inspiration and things that are influencing what we're doing today and go back to print and be like, print, you made beautiful uh, style guides or brand guidelines. You would give Legos to uh, a client and that client could go put them on an envelope. They could put them on some stationery. Um, so that was a very early set of like Lego deliverables that had some rules and some intentions. Then you have operating systems that feel very much like design systems as well, right? The first iPhone had a design system for sure. They even had a document, uh, the HIG, right? The Human Interface Guidelines. I would like to see more design systems have a HIG. That would be super cool, right? And then we had Android with Halo. Oh, these are inspirations to me. Android with Halo. You remember that one? Mm -hmm. Uh, dark and glowy. Everything looked like it had like lightning bolts or like neon around it. Actually, you know what it looked like? It looked like that Batman movie with the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was like a UI based on yeah. that. It was just, just kind of cool. Um, that's right. We had platforms. Uh, we had web kits. Oh, yeah. So this is like material, bootstrap, uh, HTML5 boilerplate, jQuery mobile. Um, yeah, those were, and what did they call those? I, you're right, those weren't design systems. They were component libraries. Like a UI framework. UI framework, yeah, pattern libraries. They had all these interesting names. Uh, I think we also take inspiration from fashion. Uh, we have this kind of goal right now. I, I have this metaphor. I like to think about a design system. It's like you're trying to make a capsule wardrobe that uh, everyone else in the company should want to wear. Right? You're like, okay, I'm the designer. We need to make uniform looking things across our site. Uh, and they should be familiar and, and, and elegant and blah, blah, blah. So what they do is they go make this, this design system that's essentially like making a set of wardrobe. Like, you can't screw this up. Just walk in the closet, grab a shirt, grab some pants, grab some shoes, grab a hat. Who cares? It all goes together. Um, and that's a, that's a term from, well, I learned it from Pinterest. I don't know where else it came from though, but the capsule wardrobe idea is this, yeah, grab and go wardrobe and we're trying to make a grab and go design system. I'm gonna hop in, grab a couple things, make a new layout, poof, be on my way. Um, so fashion I think is influencing us in that way too. They want to be very minimal, right? It's almost like Marie Kondo your, uh, your wardrobe, like go in and pull all the stuff that doesn't fit in the capsule, make a reduced set, like reduce your anxiety by <laughs> you know reducing your options. But I have a question about that. Like when you limit your wardrobe or you limit like your UI elements, 
is it true that you can have one size fits all UI elements? Or sometimes you need to reach out and use something new and different. Ooh, right? Because you don't want to wear my clothes, do you? No. <laughs> yeah, you're like, dude, your wardrobe is, well, it looks like your wardrobe. Right. Like, what if I want to have my own looking clothes? And this is where it comes down to like, um, well, and I have two opinions here. One is I don't think designers want to wear other people's clothes. So it's to me, it's a little interesting that we're trying to unite. I think the goal is super right. Like that we do need to make reusable Legos that are extendable and, and are helpful for future problems. But at the same time, the more you try to abstract and reduce these like very subjective visual emotional things into like little units, they start to feel very functional. They lose some of that, uh, that excitement, that creativity. And um, I think people want to start breaking out of your design system at that point. They feel trapped. So there's like a, there's a there's a struggle here with design systems, which is we want to empower everybody, but we want to not be trapped. We want to be able to pick clothes every day that are really easy for us, but then we want to be able to go out to a fancy dinner and not look like we're dressing from our capsule wardrobe. And especially if you have customers, customers want to have unique aspects of the site. Right. Um, and so naturally, they're always pushing on the design system to extend even more. This is a good shout out to, to Material and Google Material, the new version, um, looked at what their customers were doing, which the customers for materials, tons, right? Um, people all over the world using it from dashboards to mobile apps. Um, and in that case, they looked at how people were using it and people were constantly customizing it, right? They didn't want Material Vanilla, they wanted Material with my flair. Uh, whatever that flair was, um, like, right? Like, I want grunge material. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, well, it doesn't exist, but maybe I should make it. No, um, but yeah, they, they looked at their customers and they empowered them to uh, customize and, and extend material as a base. I thought that was really uh, uh, observant and it was like research-based. It's just a very, very nice play for the next version of a design system to lean so heavy into customization and enablement of people to fork. It's almost like they're letting people fork to, to manage their own and they can still pull updates. And That's a really great segue into my next question, which is there was <laughs> a comment on our previous video in March, The State of CSS with Una Kravitz, our guest. And this commenter, She's cool. Twisted TV says, the problem I'm seeing lately is that most websites now look the same. It's like they all have this standard template or something. Unlike back in the day when Flash was a thing, people used to create out of bounds designs along with tons of nice animations. But nowadays everything is flat, all gridded up the same way with a few minor positioning tweaks here and there. I miss those kinds of designs that today we rarely now see all because everyone is now into this flat and blocky design look. Slap a few fonts on a page and add a few pics and color on the background and you're done. That's 2019 for you. What do you think about that? Uh, you know, working at an agency, uh, even working at startups, um, we couldn't take a lot of risks and we were moving so fast that the only thing to do was affirmative design. Um, I think what this question is kind of poking at is affirmative versus critical design. Uh, and they're upset that everybody's gone uh, affirmative. They're like, ah, oh, you're just piling on to the currently socially acceptable design patterns and strategies. That's so lame, uh, which I agree, because uh, I built a lot of Flash websites, and yeah, you could land on one of my experiences, and it was like you're in a fishbowl, right? It's like Thanks fish, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could hover over the treasure chest, and it would pop open, and <laughs> bubbles would come out. <laughs> It was way more critical design, way more like experimentation and, um, and creativity. It was like you were unfettered. Um, but at the same time, if we think back at that, because there's, I think, a lot of joy and, and fun that was there, it was less serious and it wasn't really achieving uh, inclusive design as well. I think one of the reasons, folks, other than you know, you know, being safe is that flat and, and choosing some these modern strategies, they really, make accessibility easier because um, you're not going critically. You, you don't have to go undo something to be inclusive. So I think inclusive design, which is a really uh, impressive and great push that we're doing right now, is also kind of inhibiting some of our exploration because we want to be able to reach as many people as possible. And affirmative design is lulling, right? You visit it and you're like, 
All right, well, I don't really have to stress while I'm here or do very much deep diving. There's the navigation menu. There's my primary action button. If I scroll down, yep, there's three little things that tell me about uh, the, feature this, uh, the, uh, the features of this product. Uh, oh, uh, Harry Roberts right. today. Harry Roberts today writes this thing. Wait, he basically is like requoting this person. Yeah, I have a quote here. Flat design and the rise of more and more digital products does seem to have killed off a lot of that exuberance and experimentation, which is a huge shame. I miss the days of seeing what adventurous and out there things people were trying to create. You would log in every day just to see what crazy stuff people built, whether it was Flash or Web. Um, I feel that. I think uh, there's, a, there's another tweet. I can never remember the guy's name. I think it's John Gold. <gasps> I remembered someone's name. Wow. <laughs> we'll have it. I know your name too. Yeah, Rick Viscomi. Mm. Uh, it's a great name. This tweet, though, had two images up, and it was like, which site are you building? The one on the left or the one on the right? And they're pretty much identical. They, they're like big. There's a nav bar at the top. There's a big header image with big, ginormous text in it that's like, there's a problem. And then underneath that, it's like, we've got the solution. <laughs> right? Uh, and they're both there, and they're the same. They're like the practically the bootstrap templates that you could get for free. They're practically the, the theme for every WordPress site is now looks like this. Uh, and the coolest and most creative and critical ones might have a video playing, right? With text over top, like, whoa, they put some extra effort into that one. Uh, that picture is animated. <laughs> <laughs> do you consider Bootstrap to be a design system? I do. Um, I don't think they do. Uh, well, and maybe this comes down to where I'm, I'm curious about what a design system is and how it's different than a pattern library. Um, I think, I think it's that designers were more involved in a design system, whereas like Bootstrap is very developer-led. I think design kind of came in a little bit later after their Legos got really popular. And so, yeah, I think, I think they're a design system that just kind of got there in a different way. Um, the result, the thing that they have, the tangible thing I can go pick up off the shelf and just like place in my tool belt, right? Uh, I'm, I'm Wayne right now from Wayne's World, so I just grabbed my like from the back of the car. If anyone remembers the shockers, mm -hmm. anyway, whatever, that's bootstrap right now. Uh, I could go get that off the shelf and be immediately um, useful with it and solve my future problems. It's like the same value props that I got and, and we're sharing about a design system. You could get them from bootstrap, but it doesn't call itself a design system. Um, I can't remember what their homepage says. Um, I think they're one. So according to the HTTP archive, Bootstrap is used on like one out of every four websites, at least in some fashion, which is a surprising stat. Kudos to y'all. But could that contribute to this feeling that websites are all looking the same if 25% of the web is using Bootstrap with the same type of layout? Um, is it possible that Bootstrap is a victim of its own success in a way? Ooh, I like that phrase. Victim of its own success. Uh, yeah, yes, I, I think they are. This, this is funny. This reminds me of uh, two, two metaphors that I want to share. Like, bootstrap is funny. Like, if you think back to high school, there was probably a super cool band that their album just came out. And you were like, love that band. So cool. And you listened to them a ton. They made a second album, bootstrap four. They made a second album, and you're like, this band's still cool. Or bootstrap three. And then it gets really popular. And everyone's listening to them. And it's like some fool who you don't like shows up wearing the band shirt. And you're like, OK, that's it. <laughs> done with this band and you start calling them a sellout and the reality is it's like they're now popular they're now making money they're successful you should be happy for them but instead you're turning your nose up in like this like defensive disgust like eh, i don't want to use it anymore even though all the stuff you built with it was great all the music and moments you had with that band were really nice um but it's hard for anything to stay in fashion for too long that's kind of like the second metaphor is like the wardrobe um, we all had favorite stores we shopped at back in the day, uh, whether it was Zoomies or Gap or whatever, right? And these were like places we went to go make easy decisions that helped us uh, get on with our day and that we were still picking something like relatively cool and meaningful. But then it just gets old. Uh, we're kind of rude as humans. You know, we, we, we burn through stuff all the time. We consume it and we're like, this is so good. And then we throw it in the trash. Um, so I think Bootstrap is a victim of its own success, but it's also very much still a success. I think being successful is hard. I mean, look at any big framework of like, whether it's a JavaScript framework or a big design tool, as soon as you hit the big shots and like you're the cool one, everyone wants to take you down. Um, 
and that's that's a hard life to be in. So Bootstrap, stick it out. I, I think it's still a great product. It's obviously uh, just reaching a different market, almost like the pop band, right? The pop band, Green Day, right? Loved their first couple albums. Third one came out. <laughs> I didn't want to play that band anymore. Um, but they reached a whole new set of people. And those folks fell in love with them in a way that I didn't. And I shouldn't say that Green Day is bad. I should say that Green Day is successful and they're reaching new people. And I still like their dookie. So you spent a year as a UX engineer at the Google Cloud team as a design systems engineer, so to speak. Yeah. What was your experience on that team? Yeah, that was really, that was oh, so illuminating. So yeah, I was a... My title was really long. You ready for this? I was a UX engineer on the design systems team of GCP through a design lens. So they have two different types of UX engineers. There's uh, UX engineer engineer, and then there's UX engineer design. So I was on the design side. I was in a team of four or five other UX engineers who were supporting the design system, which had a big team. And I, I, this was really cool to see how much commitment Google had to their design system, uh, in so much that this team was made up of three teams. There was a trifecta, oh, 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 it's like the triforce of folks were managing that design system. That design system is creating jobs. Um, and it was really interesting to see how all of them were working together, what problems they were solving. And there's two things I want to point out. Uh, the first one I think is really interesting in meta which is uh, Google, oh, here, I'll just start with the first one. It was built on Angular. So it was Angular, uh, which was transitioning from Material 1 to Google Material. Um, and Angular was doing a good job at this work. The, the struggles that they had were with how many customers that they had. So this is where I like this meta comparison. You have Google Clouds and their design system, which they call their design system a condensed version of material. So it's like a child theme. It's like they forked Google material and made an enterprise condensed version that's not as airy and fluffy. Um, that's interesting because that means Google Cloud is a customer of another design system. Simultaneously, they have hundreds of customers. So they've got customers that are internal, right? Um, App Engine, uh, there's like various products and each one of those products has a team. Each one of those teams are consumers of this design system. That's crazy. Then you have third party players, people that wanna add plugins or other support and other features into GCP that also wanna use your design system. So they had this really, really unique uh, scenario where they were simultaneously a customer of a design system and a producer of a design system. Um, anyway, yeah, it's meta, I liked it, and um, they were really um, adamant and very good at listening to all of these different customers and trying to make this thing work for everybody. Um, but it's a very difficult task. They're hiring. They have um, tons of headcount because this is, GCP is humongous, mm -hmm. and they need help. That, and the UX teams there are really fun and really cool, so if anyone's looking for roles, uh, GCP in Seattle. We'll put a link in the description. Yeah, sure. So you mentioned something earlier I want to come back to, inclusive design. What is that and what is the purpose of it? Oh, man, this is so, so inclusive design. We want, I, this is so funny it has a name because I feel like it's the thing that everybody's wanted the whole time. We want our content to be accessible for as many people as possible. Right? Like, why did we have to put a label on that? Um, I think the label is there and, and what it means is you need to have a site that's accessible which really means you just need to test first. Um, testing your site for accessibility is always this awesome empathy experience where you're like, oh, no, my site's probably fine on that. And then you go tap through, you're like, it works. It's not elegant. Um, and that's sort of like inclusive design. It's like taking that extra step to empathize, research, ask folks, and adjust your design to be more inclusive. So this can come down to things like contrast ratios, uh, font weight thinness, uh, tab um, flows, and stuff like that. So looking ahead, what do you see the role of components in future design systems? I think we're only going to get more complex as things go on. Um, we're noticing now that our components aren't good enough yet still, especially once you get to inclusive design areas where you thought you were done, and then you go test, and you're like, oh, we're not done. Sometimes those can shake the whole foundation of your application. And um, I think it's healthy, though, that people are investigating that. Other future things, I would love to see, uh, you know, voice. We have so much voice interaction coming in. Why don't we have a design system for voice? 
I think that would be really interesting. Uh, green lines, I would like to see design systems providing green lines. What are those? Green lines are uh, an accessibility indicator. So where a red line is you just saying, I intend for this avatar to be 45 pixels wide and 45 pixels tall with a border radius of 50%, so it's a circle. Like you're, um, it's a traditional way of marking up a document to encourage or, or be precise about the presentation that you want. Accessibility is a similar, um, similar push. We're like, oh, I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna look at this little form input. I'm gonna look at this form button. Uh, I'm gonna go and indicate that these three areas should be tab indexed uh, this way. And it's sort of a designer taking control of the accessibility experience and saying, and, and just being very deliberate and clear about what it is they expect this to do. Um, and yeah, it's nice. It's the designers making those decisions as opposed to leaning on uh, front end to do it. And how about mobile? Mobile is usually forgotten too, right? So we got components, um, or it's funny, material almost did the opposite. Material is mobile first, mm -hmm. and then you sort of have to uh, expand on a couple things to get desktop to work. Most design systems I see these days are desktop focused, and then they, they start to squish things down uh, as things go. So I'd love to see mobile included more components. Yeah, good call. How do you see the relationship between designer and developer evolving? I want to see them um, communicating a lot more. Uh, John Maida recently um, had a very provocative titled article, but ultimately what he was pushing for is a, a switch in strategy where traditionally he was um, a proponent of design-led. He was like, yeah, the designer should be at the top of the company, maybe even like making all the decisions. Like if you do that, then elegance is sure to be achieved. And um, that's successful in a lot of ways, but what he's seeing now after a few years of this is that engineering is really, really important too. Engineering is um, required in order for elegant design to even be achieved. So what he's saying is no designer, I'm, I'm probably gonna you know, butcher this title, but no designer will be more successful than another designer unless they're integrating themselves richly with engineering. The pitch is, the designer isn't necessarily the leader of the show anymore. He kind of says, you should be a supporting actor or actress. And even though that might be a little hurtsome, hurtsome, hurting to your ego, you can still go see a movie where the supporting actor or actress was the star of the show. There's just a relationship that needs to happen here that's just richer and deeper integration. Designers need to be included more across the, the wide array of um, design decisions that are getting made. And a lot of those design decisions are made in code. So designers, get in there, uh, meet those folks, uh, sit with them every day, and try to have rich conversations about um, the engineering side of things and, and get ingrained. They'll ask you and they'll want your opinion. I think, I feel like engineers make a lot of decisions today that they'd rather not make. And it's just because no one is there to do the decision making for them or to tell them what it is. Uh, so they kind of have to make it up as they go. Um, which puts the front end uh, engineer into an interesting predicament. Hmm. Wait, I just thought of something else. This one is, this one's huge for me. Okay, so we have in the front end, especially the dependency graph is getting right. really popular. And we have uh, back end dependency graphs. We have CI, CD dependency graphs. There's no designer dependency graph. So what I wanna see is like two really weird things. First off, I wanna see design files um, pub sub, where I want a design file to publish the colors and publish spacing units and like some of these like really um, atomic units. Like think of Tailwind. Tailwind is this phenomenally reduced um, design system. They have a file. And I love it because it's almost like if you were to, uh, did you see the movie uh, Perfume, the story of a murderer? No. Uh, it was a creepy movie, but he did something interesting, which he was trying to distill the essence of beauty into like a thing that he could hold. Um, I feel like Tailwind did that. They took a design system and they looked at all the different pieces and they started just like organizing and, and plucking them and, and putting them into a, a nice list. And I like that JSON object. I think it's not JSON actually, it's JavaScript, which is another cool feature of Tailwind. Anyway, it's JavaScript file. Uh, that is the most reduced design system into like atomic units that I've ever seen. And what I want to see is I want to see design files publishing something like that for a front end to consume. And then I want a front end to publish 
uh, data models and um, other things for the design file to consume. I want to see a bi-directional communication happening between design apps and front-end development. The, I want designers in that dependency graph publishing values. This is like why I want them in CI CD. Like I want designers uh, reviewing PRs. I want them creating PRs. Like imagine this, like you're in your design file, you changed a base color because it didn't pass a, a contrast ratio, you know, over here in some other test. So you push uh, and you save a change, you publish the change, which creates a PR that other people can go review. Designers making PRs. Bypass the developer. Bypass the developer. I think it's a decision that designers were already making. It just was like this long-winded feedback loop to get the work in there. Like I've got other crazy ideas too where I think um, your design system should be a dependency graph where it clearly articulates what dependencies it has and what dependencies it creates for other things to consume. I like to see designers uh, making Kubernetes canary deployments. I'd even like to see, I pitched GCP on this, I think there needs to be a design focused um, cloud uh, integration so that you've got you know really rich cloud dev tooling but we don't have rich cloud design tooling like why aren't there little design tabs over there that a designer can go in create an AB test which essentially makes a canary uh, Kubernetes container that gets deployed to 5% of the users now designers can be in control of features of the front end through some um, epic and really cool cloud integrations um, yeah, I want designers, I, well, here's a challenge. I don't know how to get designers into the back end dependency graph. I have like pretty clear ideas on how to get the front end and how to get them in CI CD. Um, but I'd love it if like service designers were included in API design and somehow there was, again, a pub sub mechanism between these two where like the API team is publishing something and the service design team is publishing something. Um, there's just so much so much opportunity in this space for designers to get more richly integrated into the processes that are happening on the development side. It's not creepy, it's super rad. Like I want designers doing Semver. Uh, their design systems should be um, versioned just like the app. And optimally, they should match. It'd be really cool if like the design system was at V1.0.21 and so was the front end, right? Because it was a consumer of that version. There's a lot of opportunity. I think developers would like to have relinquished control over things like changing colors. And if the system is built well, changing the value in one place like this master file and having it applied downstream to every button and everything else that depends on that color, I think they would love that. I, I think so too. I think we just need some tooling. I've, there's a bunch of people working on uh, apps. I, last time I did research, there was like 15 of them. But it's sort of developers taking a design system, building it, and then publishing those Legos in like a design app. Um, and so that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a bunch of design apps coming out where developers are saying, hey, I've exposed the levers to these components for you in this cool tool where you can now go compose our Legos together and build something new and play in an almost production feeling like uh, design tool, but really it's still kind of prototypey because the code it's making is kind of, you know, eh. um, anyway, I think we're headed towards a really cool integration layer there between designers and developers where um, they're going to be richly working with each other. Um, and designers will start to get more intimate with like minor details about a component, like what a Boolean is and why a Boolean is different than an enum and why they should care. And because um, those things are cool. I don't think they're scary at all. Does Vizbug actually fit into that vision? Vizbug, yeah. So Vizbug's goal is, um, it's got a few of them. One of them is designer developer communication. You know, a designer is often in their design tool land over here. They've got an artboard and everything's placed X, Y, which made it really easy for them to, you know, highlight multiple and drag and delete. They had this like direct manipulation. But what is a bummer about that world is that it doesn't translate well. Somebody is always translating it. So as like a front end engineer, I would receive one of those and I start looking at it and I start translating it to code. And uh, what Visbug does is it, it sort of takes what the developers are making and lets you inspect their work like it's an artboard. And I'm, I'm seeing um, folks that are having better uh, communication with their engineers because they can feel things. There's like an empathy that's starting to happen because the complexity that is the front end uh, is now something that designers can contribute to. They can go poke and inspect and modify 
and, and experience why some of these things are complex or experience how easy some of this stuff is. And so VizBug is definitely in there in the game to help designers and developers communicate better. It has some features where, you know, if you modify some CSS, you can uh, show what changed and screenshot that and send it to an engineer. So there's an opportunity to even be like super articulate to a, um, a developer about what it is you need. Um, but it's also, VizBug has this other goal. So, it's kind of, so VizBug is kind of like Firebug for designers. Its goal is to provide uh, the same thing that Firebug did for developers, but something for designers. So give me tooling that's familiar to me in the end environment uh, that can help me make better decisions. And, uh, and it does that, I think, really well. It has a bunch of cool features, too. I'll just like breeze over them really quick. But there's, there's guides, so you can hover and see lines and, and detect measurements. You can do measurements. Uh, you, can ins you can hover and instantly see any styles that are there. And I've done a lot of work to make sure that those styles that you see are the ones that designers want to see. You're not going to see all the, the cruft. There's an ally in or accessibility inspector. Same deal. You click it, you just start hovering on stuff, and it'll tell you accessibility details. There's margin and spacing visualizations now. So you can hover and see padding and see margin separate. So the dev tools shows them together, and mine shows them separate. Uh, and I support multi-select. So you can multi-select multiple things, and um, as a designer or an engineer, see how the spacing is creating all that white space. Like, where's the white space coming from? Is it a margin? Is it pushing? Or is it, so those are interesting. Uh, you can also create, or you can't create, well, now nah, you can't create, but you can delete, you can cut, you can copy, you can paste. Uh, you can double click any text to change it. You can change any foreground color. You can change any SVG. You can, there's a position tool. You can just select something and then drag it around the screen and totally ignore the document flow. Uh, so there's tools to help you uh, work with the flow, tools to help you uh, work out of the flow. It's about like you feeling uh, unfettered and getting an idea out right there. And, and it should feel fun. Like I wanted, it's almost like I wanted to break the glass for designers on a web page, like we're constantly pulling down these magical pieces of paper, and um, they feel so uh, far away for designers. Like oh, I can't change that. Uh, I'll just go back over here. I'll just screenshot it. I'll come over here. I'll add a white box and cover up that, and you know, like make this little Franken thing, uh, and then ship that back to the developer and be like, please, like, can you do this thing here? Um, and I'm hoping that folks start to do that in the browser which kind of comes into another value prop, but I, I do want to cover really quick that like, VizBug wants to be more, uh, well, I have this phrase, it's democratize the DOM. And really what that means to me is I want the web and designing on the web to be more inclusive. Um, I remember when it was easier and you know we were on MySpace and anybody could just go grab some CSS and paste it on the page and be like, ooh, <laughs> that's fun. That makes my brain tingle in a nice, fun For way. For better and worse. <laughs> For better or worse, right? That's VizBug's the same way, right? For better or worse, people can go visit a page and, and play. But I think what that does is it opens up uh, for children and adults to, to feel like they can play, like, there's, like it's now kind of a sandbox, which simultaneously, I think we start to, like when you, when you start to learn by playing at first, there's um, there's just something different about starting that way than like going to school and like starting all serious. So I'm hoping uh, that this can help people who are serious, but also help people that aren't that serious um, be more inclusive. And I forgot whatever the second uh, thing I was going to say was, but yeah, I mean, there's lots of interesting features of VizBug, um, but it's trying to help. It wants to wants to be the design debugging tools, Des tools perhaps. Ooh, I like that. So what resources would you recommend for people who want to learn more about design systems and everything else we talked about? Yeah, design systems. Okay, so who? there's folks. Uh, there's three folks that I'm a big fan of. Um, Dan Mall, Una Kravitz, and Brad Frost. They're, they're super articulate, vocal, public figures that are um, passionately talking about these topics and helping you ramp up uh, or ramp down. Um, Dan Mall recently has been helping people uh, not over-focus on the atomics of their design system because you can get super like wrapped up in a button. And he did this really funny thing at a list apart recently. He showed, <laughs> this is so good, he showed a button on the screen and then showed four companies that that could potentially be the button for. And he's like, whose button is that? And everyone's like, oh, 
I don't know, maybe that one? It's, it was a blue button, right? And so the point was, we can over-focus on these little things, and that's not your brand. And he's essentially pushing you to real, like, step back a little bit and determine, like, what's unique about your business and, and make, um, make components and design system out of those, like your value prop. Like, how are you different? Because the atomics are atomic. Um, I thought that was really nice. Uh, Yuna has a bunch of really cool things that she's been pitching as well. She's pitching accessibility in your components, which I think is really healthy. Uh, and she's uh, advocating for maybe you don't need one. So sometimes, uh, and this is something I'm a believer in too, which is often we want to be the top dog like now. And so we go do whatever the top dog's doing. We're like, all right, I need, you know, legendary armor. I need a sword of the gods of the 10,000 XP, right? And so we're like, poof, we show up and we're like level one, but we've got all the gear. And we're like, this will make me good, right? <laughs> uh, and it does to a point, but it can also be a bunch of baggage. And like, you can't even make it through the door of the first dungeon because sure. you're like too covered in gear, <laughs> right? You got like magic shooting out of each finger. Uh, so I like that advice too, which is like, look at the phase that you're in as a team, look at the phase that you're in as a product. Um, it, you know, notice that GCP, which is a very, very large product, has an entire team dedicated to this now. Um, it's that complex. There is absolutely value coming out of a design system, but you gotta look at the ROI, like how much are you putting in versus what you're getting out? Um, and I think that's what that warning is, is like you can spend a whole lot of time on the atomics of your design system. You can spend a whole lot of time making it really robust and then nobody uses it. So you gotta make sure you have customers. And um, Anyway, those three folks are really good at, to go um, look up and listen to. They've got plenty of material for you to study. Well, Adam, this has been great. Thanks for coming on the show. Absolutely. Yep, that was really fun. You can check out the links to everything we talked about in the description below. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.